I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University. This video is for my Theory of Ethics students, Philosophy 2310, and it concerns the first book of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, our first discussion of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So without further ado, let me proceed. As you see, Aristotle was born in 322 and died in 8, in, I'm sorry, in uh, 384. And as I said, we're going to deal with the first book of the Nicomachean Ethics. But before we do that, I want to set the context for this, our study of <coughs> pardon me, our study of Aristotle. Now, first of all, scientific method and the subject matter of a science. For Aristotle, then the subject matter in philosophy, uh, subject matter is going to be what we study, and the method to be used is to look at the individuals and then draw from our study of the individuals information that contributes to the formation of universal concepts or notions that are general with regard to that. So, for example, Aristotle was a biologist and he looked at uh, many fish of a certain species and drew conclusions as to the physiology of those fish. Well, similarly then, here in the context of the theory of ethics, we'll have a scientific method and a subject matter of science. And the subject matter of the science will be human behavior, proper and right human behavior, otherwise known as ethics. And the method involved will involve looking at what human beings do, critically reflecting on that, and forming as a result of that critical reflection, conceptions of how human beings should act. And Aristotle does this in detail. So Aristotle is not in an ivory tower away from reality somehow, but rather deeply involved in looking at the animal, in this case the human animal, and human behavior, and determining what is the right thing for a person to do. And as we'll see, what he's after is the human good, or what is good for a human being, which will bring about, or one can hope will bring about, happiness, the ultimate fulfillment of a human being. Aristotle divides the sciences, so number two, Aristotle divides the sciences into three major kinds. There's productive science, which makes a thing, such as shoes or, or houses, etc. Rhetoric is included in this. So productive science has a product or a thing as a result of its activity. Theoretical sciences, however, do not have a thing as a result, but rather knowing. So mathematics, physics, and metaphysics for Aristotle are theoretical sciences. And their, their, their aim is to just to know. <coughs> Pardon me. Practical science is our major concern here. And practical science is different from the other two kinds of science. Practical science has subdivisions of politics, household management, and ethics. And the purpose of practical science is action. In the case of, of politics, action in politics aims at the good or the fulfillment of human beings uh, in, a, in the context of a city-state or a nation, one might say, if we update Aristotle a bit, in the home, and so in the matter of managing a, a, the household for the good of everyone in the household, and I will pause for a moment here. So continuing or resuming, then I said uh, practical science aims at action or doing something. So it's not a product and it's not just knowing, but doing something, achieving something through our own action. Household management seeks to achieve through our own action what is good for the entire household, just as politics is concerned with what's good for the entire city-state. And ethics is focused on the individual, what is good for the individual. Now, I also mentioned here, I want to mention here briefly, the, the dialogue, the Mino by Plato, and its opening question and its proper answer. In the opening of the question, uh, the opening of the dialogue Mino, the question arises as to what is virtue? Mino, a character in, in the Platonic dialogue, uh, is a teacher of virtue. And Socrates discusses with him, is delighted to to discuss with him the issue, and asks, how does virtue come about? And Mino gives the following answer. He said, well, Mino, Mino's not sure what to answer, let me put it that way. Uh, but Mino uh, then discusses with Socrates, and Socrates says, is it something by nature? Mino says, no, not by nature, otherwise all human beings would be naturally virtuous. Is it something that is through teaching? And Mino says, well, that doesn't seem to be quite right, because there are virtuous men who seem not to teach their sons to be virtuous, and yet if it were something that could be taught, then it would seem that the first thing 
a virtuous man would do is teach his son to be virtuous. Is it, is it by practice? And then finally, or is it by something else? In the course of the dialogue, practice is never discussed further, but that's a hint. The conclusion of the dialogue is that it seems not to be by teaching, not to be by nature, and so it must come in some other way. And so the conclusion is that virtue is a gift of the gods and human beings have no control whatsoever about the attaining of virtue. Now, that's, that's on the surface of the dialogue. But if we change the question ever so slightly, then uh, we can, and, and modify the answer a bit, then we can see that there is a different way. And so virtue seems to come about for those who have the natural disposition for it and, not or, and have a good teacher, and, again, not or, but and practice, practice it, then the result is something truly divine, namely a wonderfully virtuous person. So virtue requires, so according to this interpretation of the dialogue, virtue requires something by nature, a natural disposition, an ability to be virtuous, which healthy human beings have, but some human beings are not healthy and don't have that ability to be virtuous. Secondly, it requires a teacher, but it's not just enough to know what must be done, then we must practice it. And when we practice it, then we establish it as a habit in us. And the result is something divine in the sense that a human being who is truly virtuous. Now, as it happens, this is exactly how Aristotle read it. And this is the foundation for his Nicomachean Ethics, as we'll see when we look at book two. But for now, let's have a look at book one in the beginnings of this. I discussed some of this in class, so this should be, go rather easily. The first question has to, the first issue has to do with the notion of the highest good or happiness. And Aristotle starts out with a discussion of the hierarchy of goods. That is, we have various levels of good things that we do as means to other, other activities and other achievements, that sort of thing. And so it's, it's good to practice playing basketball, but you do that for a greater good. Perhaps you do it because you're on a team and your team wants to compete in a certain league or something of that sort. And so it wants to achieve that, that, that ability to compete. And so to compete at a high level of activity. So it's natural for us, as it, for all of us even now, to have a hierarchy of goods in our minds as we pursue action and good action. So you're here in the classroom, uh, in your classroom, in order to complete this course, because this course is one of the required classes for your degree at Marquette. And so it's, it's a lower good on the way to a greater good, your graduation and, and your fulfillment perhaps, or perhaps even something greater. That is, we might choose certain things now with a desire to be happy. And the question for Aristotle is going to be then, the ultimate happiness, what sorts of choices do, should we make along the way? What is the nature of a human being? And how does a human being achieve good for him or herself? That good being ultimately happiness. So good is desired as an end or a goal. And then we have a hierarchy of goals. So the goal to do well in a, in a particular class is part of, to do, part of the goal to do well in a particular program, which is part of the, part of the uh, desire to do well in, in the university uh, as a whole. And that's part of, the, part of what contributes to your doing well in your life in your chosen pursuit. So that's what Aristotle has in mind. This is a and it's natural. This is nothing new to you. And so Aristotle then takes up the issue, what is the greatest or highest good? The characteristics it seems to have are that it's pursued for its own sake, not for the sake of something else. It's not chosen because of something else, as I indicated. And we don't pursue it forever and ever, but rather it's something that's achievable. And of the various goods, it would be the best good. So these are the criteria that Aristotle uses for determining what we mean by the highest good. So it's the best of all the various goods that we can pursue. The science that pursues this most broadly is political science because it prescribes what's to be studied and directs learning. There are other things such as generalship, household management, rhetoric, and other things subordinate to it. Those are all tools toward the achievement 
of what's good for society in political science. So political science makes use of other sciences and determines what's to be done or avoided. So Aristotle says, its end, or goal, will include the ends or goals of the other sciences. And so political science will be focused on the human good, especially for a large group. He says, and since it uses the other sciences concerned with action and moreover legislates what must be done and what avoided, its end will include the ends of other sciences, and so this will be the human good. For even if the good is the same for a city as for an individual, still the good of the city is apparently greater and more complete, a good to acquire and preserve. For while it's satisfactory to acquire and preserve good even for an individual, it's finer and more divine to acquire and preserve it for our people and for cities. And so, since our line of inquiry seeks these goods for an individual and for a community, it's a sort of political science. That is, ethics is a kind of political science, a subdivision of political science, is probably a better way to put it. Now, how exact can political science be? Well, it can't be perfectly exact. It's not a mathematical science. Since political science depends upon the activities of human beings, it will be dictated, its, uh, its achievement of the good will be in accord with the various choices that people make. And yet our ability to understand the minds of people and the reasons they make their choices is very limited. So while in mathematics things can be quite precise, in this science we have to aim at the truth in a kind of rough or general way. And uh, since we argue about what is usually good, and so our conclusions can be no better. That is, we're trying, we figure out what is usually good, and we pursue that as, uh, as what should be pursued in the science. Maybe we need to more critically examine that, and that's what actually Aristotle actually has in mind. So, how do we judge an ethical theory? If Aristotle is going to be judging these, these various goods, how do you judge it? And he says, well, the best judge is a person who's educated in these matters. And the people who are not well educated in these matters are often young people who lack experience and are guided by feelings. So the end of action, and the end is action in this case, and not knowledge. So young people are good at mathematics and other kinds of learning, but they're not necessarily good at bringing your actions about in the world, since that requires experience. So he's not saying that young people are stupid, but rather that experience is an important factor in considering what's good for human beings. And he says, he states it this way, it does not matter whether he is young in years or immature in character since the deficiency does not depend on age. So it's not absolute with regard to young people. But it results from following his feelings in his life and in a given pursuit. For an immature person, like an incontinent person, an incontinent person is a person who can't control himself, gets no benefit from his knowledge. But for those who accord with reason in forming their desires and actions, knowledge of political science would be a great benefit. So if you think about what is the greatest good in society and for human beings, if you're pursuing that, then certainly a knowledge that concerns action will be of great value. So knowledge is, is very valuable, but we also have to control ourselves and be mature and focused and not just controlled by our wants, needs, and desires. And again, take note, he says, young, it does not matter whether he is young in years or immature in character. So there are older people who are immature in character, and they have not benefited from their knowledge, and they have not benefited from their experience. The people we want to have advise us in these matters are those who have knowledge and have benefited from experience. Now, the subject matter of this. Well, we start with what human beings do, or their common beliefs. One. Uh, an easy one is that good is happiness. But then what is happiness? All right, so happiness. Is happiness pleasure? Is happiness honor? Is happiness wealth? Surely all of us at some time or another have uh, had this cross our minds that we would only we would truly be happy if we could have this or that pleasure. Or truly happy if we only had more money. Or truly happy if people would just recognize us for the good persons we are or the talented people we are. But what Aristotle wants to do is look at those common beliefs that people have and look at them critically and examine them carefully. <coughs> so 
So here we are at the beginning. We're using common beliefs. This is the methodology. We observe the common beliefs of human beings, and we're going to use them to seek out the principles behind them. Once we have the principles or rules, we can judge the common beliefs and perhaps even argue about how we should act in order to attain our goal, which is the good or human happiness. So the first thing we do is we take the data of experience and try to form from that certain principles to guide us. And when we have those principles guiding us, then we can come down and choose the common beliefs which are, met, are best suited for our purpose of finding for ourselves what is good and right and what will bring about the best in society. Of course, not all inferences from common beliefs are correct. And so the common critique is that, that the happiness is to be found, or the best good is to be found in the life of pleasure. But that's clearly not the case. If we have pleasure all the time, we're not fulfilled as human beings. And we often set aside pleasures for the sake of a greater happiness. It seems that happiness and the human good are not necessarily just pleasure. It may, they may involve some pleasure, but they're not just pleasure. What about the life of action for honor, acclamation, so that you can, so that others will honor you greatly and clap for you and that sort of thing and praise you? The problem with that is that it puts, puts our good or our happiness in the hands of other people. And that doesn't seem right. It should be something that's in our control. It's possible for a group of people to be deceived, or the public generally to be deceived about what's really happening, and for them to think that someone who's honorable is in fact dishonorable. What about the life of money making? People often say, if I only had more money, uh, and I would be happy. And yet the life of money making is, is confused because Money is made for the sake of something else. It's not, a, it's not a good or the ultimate happiness for human beings, but money making is merely a tool. And those who think that money making is an end in itself surely don't understand the nature of money as a tool for fulfilling ourselves in other ways. Aristotle's conclusion here in this discussion is that the life of study is best and, and most appropriate for those who would want to achieve the good or happiness. Now don't get the idea by the life of study that he means that you must be in the library all the time, but rather what he means is a life that takes things seriously, takes our actions seriously, and is concerned about bringing about what is right and good for each person in the society. So that's the sense of study, that is to achieve for ourselves and other persons what is good and right. And that can be hard. We have to think about that very carefully quite often. So, for Aristotle then, the good is the end of an action in this science of ethics. The good we seek is complete, and by that we mean that it's pursued for itself, it's worthy of choosing for itself, or choosing it for itself, and it's unconditionally complete. It's not almost complete, but rather the good is complete. Three here, happiness meets the criteria for completeness. But other goods, such as wealth and pleasure, etc., don't meet the completeness criteria. Again, money is used for, used for uh, another purpose, not just to have money itself. And four, the good is self-sufficient, and so is happiness. What is self and five, what is self-sufficient is most choice-worthy, and so is happiness. So what Aristotle has done here is he's starting to begin to identify happiness, the the, the characteristics of happiness with the characteristics of the good. He doesn't do it absolutely here, but he's identifying that they seem to be the, the same in many respects. Happiness is self-sufficient, so is the human good self-sufficient. Uh, happiness is complete, and, and the human good, as, an, and a, as, a, as a fulfillment in action, seems to be complete too. So he's just, he's just setting up the parallels. They seem to be almost the same kind of thing. He's not saying immediately that they are, although that's what he's ultimately going to say, the human good is happiness. But here he's just moving slowly and setting, up, setting them up and showing that they have the same characteristics. Then he gives a clearer account of the good 
And he says, it's the human soul's activity expressing virtue. You remember virtue is excellence. I mentioned this in class several times. So human act, the human soul's activity expressing virtue. This involves then one, if someone has a function, it, it's good, depends upon its function. Second, what sort of things have functions? All sorts of things have functions. Uh, this cup has a function. If it didn't have a handle here, it wouldn't function so well as a cup. Or if it were cracked and spilling out coffee, then it wouldn't function very well as a cup either. So, uh, so human beings too have functions. And the function of a human being seems to be an activity, this is number four, the function of a human being seems to be tied up with the human good as an activity expressing excellence or virtue. And this human, be human good must be complete. Now notice what he's done here now. He's taken the human good and connected it with the notion of excellence or virtue, or excellence as a human being. He's not yet defined exactly what he means by excellence of a human being. But it seems that whatever we do, it must be tied up with an excellent activity if we're the, what we're doing is to pursue what is good and good for us in that sense. Now Aristotle allows for some reservations on this. And of course all of Book 1 is just a kind of a sketch to begin us on the road to understand what Aristotle is doing. He says this is just a sketch or an outline and we'll get into more details later. And of course recall what he said earlier about the inexactness of ethical science. Why is ethical science inexact? Because of the complexity of human beings. We can't we can't delve into the minds of human beings, and so we can't understand the intentions of their actions. And we can't judge people very well, or judge what actions are right or wrong, unless we know the intentions with which they're done. This will come out later in Aristotle. And here he writes at 1098b3-8, through 8, quote, Some principles are studied by means of induction, some by means of perception, some by means of some sort of habituation, and others by other means. In each case, we should try to find them out by means suited to their nature and work hard to define them, for they carry great weight for what follows, for the principle seems to be more than, the, more than half the whole and makes evident the answer to our many questions. In other words, we should take some time as we slowly figure out what are the principles in accordance with which human beings should act. One indicated already is in the notion of pursuing the human good as the pursuit of excellence or virtue. That's the beginning of an indication. And he's putting together the meanings of these terms in ways to set out what he, what he views as the ultimate human good. He then gives a, uh, an account of the good from common beliefs. So he has a common, a common classification of goods and a common conception of happiness. And we find there are com commonly accepted features of happiness. Notice he's using that, as he says, common beliefs. And now some of the things that uh, are commonly accepted as features of happiness are virtue, pleasure. And Aristotle also adds uh, that this satisfies traditional notions, that is, pleasure is part of what we do. We need pleasure to draw us in to do various activities. But first he puts virtue, or excellence of human action and character. And he also talks about external goods. Now this discussion of external goods is worth thinking about for a moment or two. We need goods that are outside our control if we are to be happy. If someone is struck down with cancer or run over by a truck or something of that sort, then this is, this, this is not an external good. We need good fortune, and we also need things outside of us, such as friends and, and much, much more. We need to be in a society that values us and our work and our actions. And so it's not, for Aristotle, something completely in our control. That is, the attainment of happiness is not fully in our control, but it requires external goods that are not in our control. What we can do is control as much as possible the conditions uh, that put us into a position where if we have good fortune, then we can have virtue and happiness. 
So we need to control ourselves as much as possible to put us in the position where we can seize upon happiness when it makes itself available if we're fortunate. Fortunate not to be struck down by disease or the vehicle or, or other difficulties. So virtue and external goods. How is happiness acquired? See, now this is much like what we saw in the Mino. Is it a gift to the gods? No. For Aristotle, happiness is acquired through excellence of human action, our own actions, and not by chance. But still, as I said earlier, chance or fortune affects happiness. My father died when I was 19, and he was the parent that raised me. Did this affect, affect my happiness at the time? Yes, of course it did. So it was bad fortune, bad luck. Did I, had, did I lose my entire life over that? No, I had to move on as, as human beings always do. And they have to cope with difficulties in life. But that was an external good, and the external good that, that uh, I'm sorry, was an external uh, event that affected my happiness for some time. And I had to learn to adapt to the situation. Is it correct, Aristotle asked, to call somebody happy only when he's dead? What's he getting at here? And why would he even raise such a silly question? Well, Aristotle talks about this at some length, and he says that we talk of the happiness of the dead. And the issue would be, is can the, can the activities of the children of a person affect the happiness of a person? So if the, if the father doesn't know what the children are doing, can the father think himself to be happy when in fact he is not? So if the children are stealing cars or dealing drugs or something of that sort, and the, yet the father thinks they're not and everything is wonderful, is he happy if he thinks he's happy? Or does happiness have external, have, pardon me, have its own criteria? In other words, is it possible for us to be incorrect when we think we're happy? So Aristotle's discussion here is precisely on this, and I think that's his purpose. That is, he wants to set aside the notion that, that virtue or happiness is in the eye of the beholder. Rather, he thinks that there are objective criteria on the basis of which we can judge whether someone is happy. And certainly we often do things or make wrong turns in life and, uh, and they turn out not to be the turn we should have made. Even though at the time we thought it was the right turn, we were happy with the right turn of what we did. So I think what Aristotle is getting at here is that we need to keep in mind that happiness is just not whatever we think it is, but happiness is something that has criteria and we can make mistakes on the way to happiness. We can think that something is key to happiness when in fact it is not. Something we've already seen with regard to, with regard to wealth uh, and, and other considerations as well, and wealth and pleasure. Pleasure is part of life, it's an important part of life, but it's not the ultimate human good. So Aristotle here, I think, is trying to set up using this notion of does someone's happy, can someone's happiness change after the person has died? To, to let us know that their happiness is, a, is a something about which we need to make very careful decisions and use all of our knowledge because we can easily make mistakes about it. So, of course, the dead, the happiness of the dead does not change. For Aristotle, there is no afterlife, and so the happiness of the dead does not change anyway. But the happiness that we might attribute to someone who's dead is is through the view of that person's life as we see it. And our sight of that life may be incorrect. Or a father may die, uh, may, may die happy in knowing that his child is on the right road that's, uh, and, and to a career and that sort of thing. But what if, it, what if it's not true? What if the child was not on the right road? So happiness is the kind of thing of which we can make mistakes. And so I think that's what Aristotle is after here. Now, what Aristotle's done so far in Book One is the beginning of an account of virtue. And the consideration of happiness requires an account of virtue. 
but we need an account of what the human being is before we can proceed to find out what excellence of, human, of a human being is. And so Aristotle gives us a basic psychology of what the human being is. Human soul is that by means of which we act. And soul here just means life principle. Don't think of, you, need not, you need not think of it in religious terms. So Aristotle says the human soul or, uh, or life principle has two major parts, a rational part and a non-rational part. The rational part has to do with thought, and excellences of that are excellences of intellect. The non-rational part is subdivided into two further parts. One part, he says, is unresponsive to reason. This might be like the, the life principle of your body as blood throws, flows through your veins uh, and uh, arteries, or as, as the heart pumps and that sort of thing. So this is not something that if we just reason with it enough, we can change it. So some of these things are just natural to us. So that's the non-rational part of the life principle, which is not responsive to reason, is unresponsive to reason. But there's another part that is able to be responsive to reason. And that other part is our emotions. So ethics and considerations of character, are excellence of character, are going to be concerned with emotions, having them under proper control and directing emotions appropriately. And what directs emotions appropriately and, and keeps them under control is going to be a matter of knowledge. But it's not just knowing what's right, it's going to be practicing what's right and controlling ourselves in order to attain excellence through disciplined understanding and disciplined activity in the world. But Aristotle needed to put this in, this can put in something about this conception of human nature. And we are able to, our, our emotions are able to, to respond to reason. We can follow reason with our emotions, but it requires a great deal of self-control. But I, I can't reason about how my, my, my hair on my arm grows or any, any number of other things. These are not matters of ration, rationality, but it's another aspect of the life principle called soul. The focus of ethics, then, is going to be on the non-rational part of the soul, which is able to respond to reason. And that non-rational part is my ethical self. So I, I, I should use reason there to control my emotions to attain what is good for me. So that's, that's uh, this results, then, uh, in this consideration here, as I said earlier, with consideration of excellences of thought and, and excellences of character. Excellences of thought concern wisdom, comprehension, intelligence, and often they are native to us, that is, they are born into us. But virtues of character, such as temperance, generosity, courage, these are learned. And the focus of theory of ethics is, uh, pardon, the focus of ethics for Aristotle is on virtues of character. So sometimes Aristotle's ethics is called virtue ethics or ethics of character, or even an ethics of happiness. So I'm going to pause there. That's, the, that's uh, book one of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, uh, major issues that I wanted to discuss. And I'll stop here and uh, proceed in a few minutes with book two.